Kia ora everyone, I'm Shannon and today I'll be reading an excerpt from the Wingspan Journal, Volume 18, an article written by founder and director of Wingspan, Debbie Stewart, entitled On the Wing, Urban Release of the New Zealand Falcon. The first release of a threatened species in the centre of a New Zealand city was a brave conservation initiative. Wingspan continues to have a proactive approach to the conservation of raptors, and the urban falcon release project on the wing has now made conservation history. Because the New Zealand falcon is recognised as a very adaptable species, the philosophy behind the project was to test key objectives. Could falcons live in an urban environment? Could people tolerate and live alongside falcons? We wanted to investigate the methodology of urban falcon reintroductions, increase exposure of falcons to a wider audience, and bring falcons into the lives of everyday New Zealanders. This conservation project was multi-layered. It was about captive management, rehabilitation, education, and public awareness, one layer at a time. In the general conservation arena, more often than not, threatened species are taken to offshore islands. These islands are considered the safety nets, free of pests and threats. Unfortunately, this approach often disadvantages the general public, most people don't get to see our threatened species, enjoy them, or be aware of the issues they face in today's environment. The irony is that biodiversity, in its rawest sense, is seldom recognised on our island sanctuaries. Managers of threatened species recovery programmes usually don't celebrate raptors, sometimes despise them and shoot them or remain reluctant to accept raptors until populations of prey species are on a sustainable, natural level. So an holistic approach and understanding of New Zealand's biodiversity is the key. Being top of the food chain, raptors are revered and respected around the world. From the pyramids of Horus, the steppes of Mongolia, and the sands of the Middle East, to the big skies of the USA. Sadly, not in New Zealand. We are quick to save and defend the whales, the dolphins, even the sharks on our shores. They are the marine equivalents of our natural endemic predators. But for falcons, our country's top avian predator, there are those who are distinctly birdist. Research shows that the biggest problems facing New Zealand's endemic falcon include deliberate shooting, electrocution, and pests like feral and stray cats, all of which are human-based effects on our endemic wildlife. Every year, Wingspan receives injured and rescued raptors, and where possible, we offer rehabilitation. Then they are released back into the wild. Unfortunately, some raptors cannot be released due to permanent injury. So, if we can, the captive breeding program pairs these birds together and their young are released. By far the most effective and successful method for releasing young raptors has been by the process called hacking. It is the placement of juvenile birds into an artificial nest box where they are protected from the elements, provided supplementary food and where they can imprint on their surroundings. Wingspan has been successfully releasing falcons by hacking for close to 15 years. The methodology is centuries old and practiced around the world. Today the method has been refined by the Peregrine Fund in the US, who have re-established raptor populations of peregrine falcon and California condors. It has been used to save birds such as Mauritius kestrels, 
at Plumado Falcons, Harpy Eagles and Red Kites. Sightings of Cardiadea are sometimes reported in urban landscapes, but nesting by adults in strictly urban environments has never been recorded. Throughout North America, Canada and Europe, urban releases of falcons have been very successful, with the high-rise apartment buildings within these landscapes being no different to the cliffs and nest ledges of more natural settings. For Wingspan's 2013-2014 release programme, we were keen on adapting and trialling this international experience for Kaerea so a suitable urban site was required. Without question, the Rotorua Museum Te Whare Taonga o Te Aroa was an obvious choice. The ornate and grand bathhouse building housing Rotorua Museum marks the heart of Rotorua City and is centred in the middle of a crater on the shores of Lake Rotorua. The bathhouse in the government gardens was constructed in 1908 as a major tourist spa destination. The South Wing opened as a museum in 1969, the North Wing in 1977 as an art gallery. In a major redevelopment, the building was renovated and finally completed to the original design in 2011 with the addition of a new wing named after the late Don Stafford to house the taonga or treasures of Te Aroa. This heritage building in which Rotorua Museum tells the stories of the history and culture of the Rotorua area borders a wildlife refuge and remains the most photographed building in New Zealand. For the Falcons, it seemed the perfect urban site with open gardens and lawns, panoramic views of Rotorua, good numbers of prey species and can be seen from vast distances in all directions. Evaluating the risk to the falcons was very important. The possibility of electrocution was low due to the underground wiring in the area, and we believed that deliberate shooting would not be an issue once the young falcons began hunting and likely visiting people's backyards. Young falcons can spend a lot of time on the ground, so feral and stray cats remained one of our biggest concerns despite the fact that the government gardens borders a designated and legally protected wildlife refuge. Rotorua City Council representatives told us the wildcat issue within the gardens was bigger than Texas, and the Department of Conservation staff concurred. Letters were sent to the local SPCA, who confirmed to their knowledge at least three supported stray cat colonies and confirmed their own tag, neuter and release cat releases. They advised against the release of a threatened New Zealand species within the gardens. At Wingspan in the meantime, falcon pairs were laying eggs and rearing chicks. One of the North Island bush falcon pairs laid three eggs at the end of October, which hatched successfully 33 days later. Just like their natural parents would, the Wingspan staff hovered over them, providing special care, special diets and regular health monitoring for their first three weeks. Media releases were prepared. We completed letter drops to commercial and residential neighbours surrounding the gardens. We held volunteer workshops and training sessions, ordered special transmitter equipment and we facilitated research by a Waikato University student. Safety for both volunteers and the birds was a big consideration. The site remains an active geothermal area. The grounds are interspersed with hot water and steam, mud pools and geysers. Kairiaria falcons would have lived within this environment for millions of years, but people for just 700 years. In the 21st century, tracking falcons around hot water and steam required new rules restricted access areas, high-vis jackets, and traffic signs. The hat box and feeding trays were under construction. The Rotorua Museum staff completed a display in the foyer, complemented by exhibit items from Wingspan 
in Te Papa, Wellington. We introduced the story on Facebook and started the journey. It was an early start when in mid-December, while others were preparing to celebrate Christmas and summer holidays, the Volcanic Air Safaris helicopter arrived at 5.30am to place the hat box on top of the roof of the bathhouse. A CCTV camera was then fitted to the hat box in readiness for the transfer of the chicks. Once in the hat box, they would remain enclosed for two weeks, allowing time to imprint on their new environment. Transferring the chicks to their new home was a special day. They were checked again, banded for identification, indeed they were almost dressed for the occasion. The oldest male was given a green band, the female orange, the other male was given a white band. The falcons, with their wingspan attendants, were welcomed to the Rotorua Museum on 16 December by representatives of the museum's Pukinga, Mayor of Rotorua Steve Chadwick, staff, volunteers, tourists, plus national and local media. Komatua Anarurangihuia performed a blessing for the Kariaria. Daily feeding by museum staff was a huge effort. Every day, two people climbed stairs and ladders and lifted a small but heavy trapdoor leading to the roof platform so they could feed the chicks through a special chute in the side of the hack box. The rest of us watched via the webcam on our computers at the office and at home. We weren't the only ones. The webcam and New Zealand's first Urban Falcon release went viral. A week before the planned release date, each falcon chick was given another health check and individual transmitters were attached via a light harness over the shoulders. The harness has a weak link, should it be snagged, plus an aerial extending nearly the length of their tails. These transmitters would allow us to know where they were and to follow their development and progress. The actual release was by far the most anxious for everyone. Slowly, centimetre by centimetre, the hat box door was lowered. Two of the chicks scuttled behind to the back of the box, while the older male remained at the front. We watched the webcam nervously, but it was three days before they even stepped outside. We instantly delighted in their awkward running gaits wing flapping practice, and short clumsy jumps to the railings. Then the army of volunteers stepped in, almost 70 of them, with two hourly rosters, each all carefully organised by Rotorua Museum's volunteer coordinator. Every day, from 6am until 8pm, rain, hell and shine. Some on bikes, others with crutches, and many with young children. Each shift, they were armed with an aerial and telemetry receiver, data sheets for recording behaviour, binoculars and cameras. Online, a naming competition plus Trade Me promotion was held. By the end of January, instead of being referenced by their band colours, green, white and orange, they were officially named as Tama, Hatupatu and Te Rangirere Iwaho big names in Lotorua. The Falcons quickly gained confidence exploring their environment and new freedom. Initially, they would make short flights to turrets or towers or roost on the Grand Phoenix Palms at the front of the building. Te Rangirere Iwaho on two occasions hit a window and Tama was disorientated trying vertical flights up steep sides of the building before finding it was easier to fly around the building. Often they were bombed by nesting welcome swallows and on a couple of occasions mobbed by the black-backed gulls. After 10 days of flight, their natural attitude kicked in. The tables turned and the falcons were in charge. As a first time project, we had anticipated some negative responses from the public but there were surprisingly few. Complaints published in the local newspapers 
suggested they might attack the black swans at the lakefront reserve or fly to Makoya Island. Another letter wrote that the release would be the demise of all wildlife in the residential backyards of Rotorua. The big smile moments, including their chasing of leaves and lolly wrappers on windy days, and two of the falcons flew into a third floor apartment, Hatupatu photographed in the kitchen. Museum staff lost a bus tour of people, only to find them outside photographing the birds. The croquet players complained they were missing their turns, distracted by watching the antics of the falcons. We talked to visitors who had come from far and wide. Some had driven from all over the North Island to see them, and one couple from New York changed their travel itinerary just to witness the project. There were keen photographers that stalked the falcons on a daily basis, using up their memory cards and flattening their batteries. The falcons in just three months became the most photographed birds in New Zealand. At the end of April, the falcons continued to be monitored, photographed, and the project considered a complete success. People remain engaged, and there have been noticeable increases of visitors to both Wingspan and the Rotorua Museum. In April, we applauded the Rotorua Museum, winning a National New Zealand Museum Award for an outstanding, innovative project. Museum staff have also reported other beneficial side effects of the release in terms of pest control. A noticeable reduction of gull splash on the roof of the historic building, a reduction in the swallows nesting and fouling the building, less sparrows, feral pigeons, rabbits and pukeko digging up the gardens. This falcon release has helped change attitudes and engender more sympathy for the birds. There has been huge community engagement with accessible conservation in our backyard and an estimated reach of the project to more than 800,000 people. Tama Hatupatu and Te Rangirere Iwaho, Three Kariere, the forest falcons of Aotearoa, three Rotorua legends who have made conservation history. A program about the birds, the purpose, the people and the charm.